grace. 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 All right, well, last week we ended in chapter 6 of Job where he began to re his reply to Eliaphaz in which uh, he digs his heels in and justifies his complaint. Uh, here in chapter 7, where we're beginning tonight, Job begins to argue uh, for there being, in the end, no real meaning to his life. He feels as if it is one big rigged experience uh, over which he has no meaningful input or control. He believes that God is judging him guilty even though he's done nothing wrong. So, in Job chapter 7, uh, remembering chapter 6, was the first part of his reply to Eliphaz. Chapter 7 is the second part of his reply to Eliphaz. So, Job chapter 7, starting in verse 1, it says, Does not humanity have hard service on the earth? Are not their days also like the days of a hired man? Like a servant longing for the evening shadow, and like a hired man looking for his wages, Thus I have been made to inherit months of futility, and nights of sorrow have been appointed to me. If I lie down, I say, when will I arise? And the night stretches on, and I toss and turn restlessly until the day dawns. Now, uh, not, to sound, not to start off sounding in insensitive, but so far as we know, Job has lived a very blessed and cushioned life up to this point. He is somewhere in his late 60s, early 70s, before he encounters these horrible difficulties where he finds something in common with the rest of humanity, uh, perhaps for the first time. And with, and not only just with humanity in general, but with slaves and civil servants and those who work to make um, others rich, all of whom toil from sun up to sun down, which is the wording he uses here. He, when he says, when he talks about, does not humanity have hard service on the earth? That's referring to, um, uh, particularly that wording there implies a civil servant like someone who works for the military. They're, in other words, their days and their time don't belong to them. Okay, that's the idea here. And are not their days like the days of a hired man, meaning an employee, like a servant who there would be referred to a slave. So he's brought up three people, the employed, the slave, and the civil servant, all three. Okay, and this is the first time he's felt like he has anything to compare with them, because like I said, he's lived a very cushioned life all of his life, so far as we know, right? And so he's finally finding some type of common ground with them, a feeling like he, uh, that you know, in that in that they toil from sun up to sundown for someone else. Now the irony of this is made even greater because Job himself had many young slaves and very likely some domestic and indentured servants as well, as usually happens. This topic has come up at least twice so far on Sundays, dealing with slavery and stuff like that. This last week, in particular, it was brought up. Well, actually, it's brought up, I'm sorry, we brought it up twice on Wednesday nights. It's brought up once on Sunday, this past Sunday, and I'm going to have to bring it up again this next Sunday in the letter that Paul wrote to Philemon about Onesimus, who is brought up in, in Colossians. So, uh, so obviously, I don't know why this seems to happen as we've been going through the Bible, but there's like a topic that there's a spotlight on and it winds up being brought up on Sundays and Wednesdays without me ever trying to coordinate it. It just happens. Um, I had no idea this was happening until I was reading chapter seven today. I'm like, wow, I'm chapter, yeah, chapter seven, going back over chapter seven today. And I'm like, wow, I just brought that up on Sunday and here it is again. So the second time uh, on a Wednesday night, I'm going to have to talk about it again this next Sunday. So we'll, we'll have it two times on Wednesdays and two times on Sunday. So I don't know if it's for anybody or if it's answering a question for someone, if they're paying attention, so pay attention. <laughs> and that way, uh, if it is there to answer a question you might have that you don't even realize you have, you'll hear the answer, okay? So now, and of course, Job is, is mentioning this only by way of comparison. He, like a hired servant, like a, a civil servant, feels like his life is futile. His nights are full of sorrow and sleeplessness. It, it's a terrible condition, to be sure. There's no doubt uh, what he was going through was terrible. Now, going on in verse 5, it says, My body is clothed with worms and dirty scabs. My skin is broken and festering. My days are swifter than a weaver's shuttle, and they come to an end without hope. 
So this is a a desperate situation. Would you not agree? Uh, there's without question. I mean, for all the things that, that Job is is saying in his complaints, it's not like it's groundless. These are some pretty bad situations he's going through, and I think that we all can at least have some amount of a pity with that. I want to also point out something that was not in my notes, and I think it's important is that this is the first time we have as a uh, a measuring line of how long these events have been going on, because in the first part here in chapter seven, he says for months, for months. That's what he says here. So already we already know it's been happening for at least for months. Yes or no, right? Uh, verse three says, thus I have been made to inherit months of futility and nights of sorrow have been appointed to me. So this has been going on for a few months now. How long, I don't know, but at least for a few months. Now, I don't know where they get it from. Maybe by the end of the book, I will, as we're going through it slowly, because I've never gone so slowly through the book of Job in my life as we are right now, paying attention to every little detail that I can find. Uh, so it might pop up now where it's never really popped up to me before. But a lot of people who have studied the book seem to have a, a general consensus that these events that took place in Job's life Took the lasted about a span of nine months. Okay, so we're not talking about years and years, but we are talking about the greater portion of a year. And if you're talking about what these kind of things that he's dealing with, that's that's a long time to have worms crawling on you and uh, and be suffering from elephantitis, what amounts to like elephantitis mixed with a form of leprosy, where your your skin is decaying and and all. That. It's it's a bad situation, uh, and and he can't you know he can't work to 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 gain income and he's lost all of his land he's lost all of his property he's lost all of his servants uh well he probably owns his property still but he's lost all the crops he's lost uh his his oxen and his donkeys and his camels and everything that could tread you know plow fields and stuff like that so he's in utter abject destitution here Right, so that that's a, that's a lot in a short span of time. Now he says, my body is clothed with worms and dirty scabs. My skin is broken and festering. My days are swifter than a weaver's shuttle, and they come to an end without any hope. Remember that my life is but a breath; that my eyes will never again see happiness. He's he's already made up his mind. This and and again, I, I'm not picking on him because if you've had a few months of this. And it's just day after day after day, and there's there's no reprieve. He doesn't even get an evening off. You know what I mean? You know how you know how you can have issues in your body, and sometimes your body will give you a little bit of a break for a few hours or something like that. He's had zero break for months now, right? So it's it's an ongoing, almost worsening situation day in and day out to the point where he's also sleepless. Sleepless. He's not getting any sleep. We're gonna read that in a minute. That's a long time. Yes, Would you agree? So with all that in mind, you know, I, I think that it's important that we understand that because you can lo you can gain despair, can't you? Yes. Amen. Now, if we truly know God, is there a reason for despair? No, not in all honesty, there isn't. Uh, despair exists in a heart that's lost sight of something. It's the truth. Despair exists in the heart when we've lost sight of something. That God is greater than what's going on, even if even if God's greatness does not is not an immediate answer to my problems. Nonetheless, hope should spring eternal within the heart of a child of God. The, Jesus very clearly said it in this ministry. He said, "Men ought always to pray and not lose heart." That's our Lord's statement. Our Shepherd said, "You as a sheep have no right to lose heart. Stop it." You've lost sight of something. So he says, remember that my life is but a breath and uh, but that my eyes will never again see happiness. The eye of him who sees me now will see me no more. Your eyes will look for me, but I will be gone. As a cloud is dispersed and then disappears, so the one who goes down to the grave does not come back up again. He returns no more to his house, nor does his place of res residence know him anymore. Therefore, I will not refrain my mouth. I will speak in the anguish of my spirit. I will complain in the bitterness of my soul. That's a bad choice. Yes, bitterness. It's an understandable choice. I'm not saying that if Mark were in that same situation, I would not very much be tempted to act the same way. But even if I did, it's still a bad choice. Is somebody with me? Does that make sense to you? Now, I want to be clear, as we go through the book of Job, I am bound, I have to point out 
many of the things Job does and says that are wrong. Not because I'm picking on the man, okay? But it's important. Uh, I'm doing this uh, in order to be thorough so that when we witness God confronting Job at the end of the book, which leads to Job's repentance, you will have clearly seen that for which he's being reprimanded and for which he is repenting. If I don't point it out, you're not going to know, well, what was the guy repenting for again? Um, that's why I'm pointing this out, okay? Now, you cannot have a clear understanding of this book if you protect Job from his missteps. You have to just read them for what they are, amen? Even if we can identify with them, even if we can say, you know what, in the same situation, even in Christ, having the Holy Spirit with me, I don't know that I perform any better than this guy. All that understanding and that camaraderie and sympathy and empathy still in place it still doesn't make wrongs right. Is anybody with me? Okay. Here, Job is being unwise. It was his decision to give his mouth free expression. Let me just tell you, that's rarely a good thing. <laughs> no matter who you are, that's rarely a good thing. And his willingness to speak words guided by his experience and his pain rather than his respect for God that opened, and that opened a floodgate for many things he goes on to say later that are just dead wrong. Because, well, I mean, how many of you know it's easier to just never stop ta start talking about the bad than to turn the valve off once you started? Once you start complaining, it's hard to shut that valve back off again. It would have been better for him to just leave well enough alone. You know, to contemplate it in his mind, and 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 one additional thing that would two additional things that would have been very very good, and we'll address that as we move forward. Uh, that would probably, almost certainly, would have made this thing, if indeed it did last for nine months or even a year or two years, whatever. It probably would have made it reduced it down to maybe a month, maybe two, more than likely, if he had done these things. How do I know that? Because we've gone through the whole Old Testament and we see how God reacts with people. And if he's not a respecter of persons, then I have to believe he would have reacted this way with Job as well. Does somebody understand what I'm saying? Okay. Now, in Proverbs chapter 10, verse 19, we learn that when words, it says, when words are many, transgression is not lacking. But whoever restrains his lips is wise wise or prudent, right? So the fact that he, he he says here, therefore, because these things are true, because I'm experiencing all this bad stuff, I'm not going to refrain my mouth. I'm going to speak in the anguish of my spirit. I will complain in the bitterness of my soul. All very, very bad choices. Exceedingly bad choices. Um, now, pointing this out is not in order again to pick on a godly man. He was undergoing trials which were over the top and beyond difficult, including the loss of all of his children, everything. This wasn't just physical pain. He is still living with a very fresh memory of just a few months ago, I had children and they're all dead. I, I had, you know, I had prosperity. I had servants that I cared about. They're all dead. I had animals that I cared about. They're all dead. Right? My wife is saying yeah, I should just curse God and die because things are so bad. So, I mean, this is not just a, it's, we're not dealing with an isolated problem. You know what it's like to have a problem with, with one thing or another, maybe two or three things at once. This is everything, you know, at one time. So, if anything, these trials, if anything, you know, rather than me pointing it out and picking on a godly man, if anything, these ter trials testify to Job's overall godly character. Does, does he still say some things he shouldn't say? Does he allow himself to meditate on things he ought not meditate on? Absolutely. But overall, his character is good because God will not allow us to, will not allow us to be taken beyond the point of our ability to resist. He's confronting a lot of stuff here. That tells me that Job must have it in him. Is somebody, does that follow? You know what I mean? So again, even though I have to, even though I'm bound to point out some of the things he's doing and saying wrong and the thoughts and the meditations of his heart that are bad and could have been, uh, certainly could be improved upon, nonetheless, the very fact that these things were able to come against him tells us that the man is of the type of character that he was able to stand up underneath this. Amen? That probably can't be said about a lot of people. Now and and the now, 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 now let me just also add one other thing. 
These are not things that are of Job's own making. Now, God said he will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. He did not say that you can't bring on yourself stuff that are beyond what you're able. Okay, that's different. He will not allow the enemy to come in here and arbitrarily just do whatever he wants, bringing you beyond the brink of what you are able to handle. But can you take yourself there? Yes, you can based on what you meditate on and how you how you deal with the problem that you that was handed to you can you graduate it beyond your ability yeah you can absolutely you can right so uh, that's another little nuance i think that people miss is that you know i mean if in your life you have experienced something that seems beyond what you are able and if it legitimately is beyond what you're able then it is not an attack of the enemy because if it was attack of the enemy alone it couldn't be beyond what you're able because God won't let that happen. But can you, from your free will, throw logs in the fire and make things worse by your attitude, by your by choices that you make, by whatever, by your murmuring, complaining, and so on? Oh, yeah, yeah. Throw as much fire as you on, uh, would on you on, uh, on that thing, and it can blaze to the sky. But that's your choice, right? There is a difference between the two. Now, though Job undoubtedly wavers, he remains unwilling to let go of God or deny him. And that is something we need to also keep in the forefront of our mind. Now, the next thing is Job issues a direct and embittered line of derogatory questions at God. Now, when I say at God, we're going to see as we're reading, he really doesn't believe God's listening. We can see that by what he says out of his mouth. These are really just kind of like accusations. They're really not speaking to God like he believes God hears him. But they are they are embittered, an, embittered, an embittered line of derogatory questions at God. They are worded rhetorically so as to imply only a negative answer. So let's read it. It says, Am I the sea or the creature of the or the creature of the deep that you must put me under the under guard? If I say my bed will, be, will comfort me, my couch will ease my complaint. Then you scare me with dreams and terrify me with visions, so that I would prefer strangling and death more than life. I loathe it. I do not want to live forever. Leave me alone, for my days are a vapor. What is mankind that you are that you make so much of them, and that you pay attention to them, and that you visit them every morning and try them every moment? Try them every moment. Now, I like David's spin on this verse better. Did you guys catch that? Yeah. I, it, it, at least two or three times in these chapters that we're covering tonight, I think I know where J David got some of the, the juice for his Psalms. He had read what Job said, contemplated it, came to a better conclusion than Job did, and turned what Job said in complaint and turned it around as a praise to God. I'll read it. This one right here that you immediately triggered with you is found in Psalm 8, verses 3 through 6. He says, When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him? Just what Job just said, right? And the son of man that you visit him. For you made him a little lower than the angels, and you have crowned him with glory and honor. And you have made him have dominion over the works of your hands, and you put th all things underneath his feet. So David saw the same thing, only turned it around on its ear and saw the good in it, right? Yeah. He did, didn't he? He saw God's honor and his solicitous care for us. And you need to understand that David's life was not full of all cushiness either. He too had lost his son. He too had his his uh, his kingdom divided against him by his son. He also had had um, uh, you know uh, terrible things happen within his family and and a wife that rejected him. And um, he had uh, you know uh, even before all that thing he had th that those things he had uh, Saul pursuing him in his life and he was living in caves and and in you know in places like that in the earth and to hide away from someone who was seeking to kill him for for untold time i think it was several years that happened in david's life and yet all the time david never lost sight of worshiping and praising god even in the middle of all of that in the middle of all of it he still wrote things like this even in the middle of that so can you choose to have a heart like David? Yeah, you can. You can. Again, am I claiming that's easy? 
or that it's necessarily your first impulse. No, I'm not saying that. I'm not even saying it was David's first impulse. But rather than he probably contemplated these things in his mind, thought about it, and when he came to the meditation and conclusion that brought him back towards full circle, towards the honor and the praise of God, that's when David chose to open his mouth. Well, that's a good decision. That's a very good decision. Now, John, uh, um, and, and this, this passage, of course, is also referenced in Matthew 21, verse 16, by our Lord Jesus. In 1 Corinthians 15, 27, by uh, Paul. By, in Ephesians 1, by Paul. And in Hebrews 2, verse 6 through 8, by the writer of Hebrews. Uh, but they quoted David's version, not Job's version. Now, here in Job chapter 7, verse 19, it says, Will you never look away from me? He's Again, he's, he's talking kind of at God, right? Will you not let me alone long enough to swallow my spit? If I have sinned, what have I done to you, O watcher of men? Why have you set, you set me as your target? Have I become a burden to you? Now it's getting a little snarky, right? Am I, 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 am I all of a sudden, am I just too much for you to carry around? Am I a burden to you? Are you not strong enough for me? You know? He says, and why do you not pardon my transgression and take away my iniquity then? For now I lie down in the dust and you will seek me diligently, but I will be gone. Now, so that's the end of what Job had to say. Now Bildad takes his turn in replying to Job. He's indignant at Job's words and directs him towards repentance for his words. So starting in chapter 8, starting in verse 1, says, then Bildad the Shuite, spoke spoke up and said, How long will you speak these things, seeing that the words of your mouth are like a great wind? Does God pervert justice, or does the Almighty pervert what is right? If your children sinned against him, he gave them over to the penalty of their sin. But if you will look to God and make your supplication to the Almighty, if you become pure and upright, even now he will rouse himself for you and will restore your righteous home. Your beginning will seem so small since your future will flourish. So now these words are both right and wrong. Uh, in fact, most of what Bildad says here is absolutely correct. We have to settle as well as we might. And we've already settled it as well as we might. I should have said that way. We've already settled as well as we might that um, Job's children were in fact ungodly and most likely willfully so. They grew up in a godly home. They grew up with a godly father, the most godly man on the entire planet. And yet they still live lives of debauchery and drinking parties. And Job himself was afraid that his children would curse God and die. So obviously they were not the best children in the world. I think that's, that's a given, right? We concluded that even though we are not afforded a behind the scenes look at the conversation between God and the devil regarding Job's children, it did indeed have to take place. Um, as such, their deaths probably played out very similar to King Ahab's, which we referenced when we were in our fourth session into Job, um, in the message entitled God, Justice, and Delegated Authority. We talked about how, you know, that whole procession took place in heaven in the judgment of King Ahab, and that's probably what happened with Job's children. Bildad is correct in attributing the deaths of Job's children to their own sins and not to Job's trial. He's right. It had nothing to do with Job's trial. They only coincided, most likely due to the, the, um, the opportunity afforded the devil in his pursuit of Job's um, heart loyalty, as we addressed in our third way week into Job, entitled Job's Trial Began. Now, Bildad is, is also is correct in thinking that Job has something which is making him impure and no longer upright. He's right about that. Because some of the things that, because now Job, even if Job doesn't know what's right and what's wrong anymore, he knows that accusing God is wrong. You're never so far gone as a child of God or as someone who's got relationship with God that you are not aware from the inside out that accusing God's the wrong thing to do. You already know that. So I refuse to believe that Job's beyond that kind of knowledge. That's kind of obvious. So he's right about that that he has things that are going on that are making him right now impure and no longer upright. But he's wrong in assuming that it was these things that precipitated this initial attack against Job. 
See what I'm saying? In other words, the things that Job is saying out of his mouth now are in response to an attack that began before Job said anything wrong. Amen? So Bildad is, is, is presenting this as though this hard attitude you have, Job, is what brought all this on you. And that would be incorrect. Amen? That's not correct. In fact, if it weren't for the fact that Job had been such a good man, such an upright man, such a blameless man, this attack probably wouldn't have ever happened. So, so you see how you see how when you're reading through this, a lot of the advice that the, so far that the friends are giving is right, but then they add one little thing in there that makes it wrong. Amen. I'm going to read what Bill Dad said one more time, and you can see it. Says, how long will you speak these things, seeing that the words of your mouth are like a great wind? Does God pervert justice? Well, the answer to that is no, he doesn't. Or does the Almighty pervert what is right? Like Job is insinuating he does? No, he doesn't. If your children sinned against him, he gave them over to the penalty of their sin. He's right. But if you will look to God and make your supplication to the Almighty, he's right about that, then he will restore everything that you've lost. But he adds this next thing in here. If you become pure and upright, insinuating that this whole thing happened because you started off not pure and not right. See what he's saying? And this is the default position of both Job and all three of his friends. All of them believe this is judgment, which is what makes all of them wrong. Because it wasn't judgment. It was because God, because God had, had and, the, and the enemy had seen that Job was upright and blameless that this attack was allowed to take place to see or to demonstrate, to prove that Job, it was a testing of the faith. Just like we read in 1 Peter chapter 2 or chapter 1 in, in the New Testament, it talks about how the trying of your faith brings patience. And that, pay, and that patience have its perfect work so that you can maybe prove to be pure and undefiled and all that thing before God. It shows the purity or the genuineness of your faith. So this is, it's proving that, Je, that Job was genuine. He did not serve God just out of what he could get out of it. Amen. And that's, been, that's true and a solid truth all the way through the book. Job did not serve God just because of what he thought he could get out of it. So, that, I'm sorry? That's what Satan he was he was trying to prove that said that job only was in this for what he could get out of it and through the entire event it was proven that in fact that was not the case with job okay so that's what precip precipitated all this all these events but job and his three friends all believe it's god judging him and that's where they're wrong and you'll see it come up in their language as we move forward Right. So anyway, so we're going on uh, to, let's see, I was going to point out a couple more things. Uh, so Bildad is correct in thinking that Job has something which is making him impure and no longer upright right now. But he's wrong in assuming that these things are the things that started the whole um, event in Job's life in the first place. Job has done nothing wrong to solicit this attack, as God clearly stated back in Job chapter 2, verse 3. However, since these trials have begun, Job has thought and said several things which are stout against God, accusatory of him, and only casts himself in a good light. That is an unacceptable behavior, but it is hardly unique to Job. Bildad is also correct in saying that at this point, things are still able to be reversed um, through reverence and repentance, so that the blessing God, uh, so, um, so that the blessings God will give in the future will overshadow this brief interver interval of difficulties. He's right about all that, isn't he? And in fact, as this continues and gets worse, it's still true at the very end when God, when Job does repent and God restores everything he ever lost. It's it, the blessings he endured for another 210 years is far greater than the brief nine months or so that he ever went through this terrible thing. Not to mitigate how terrible this was, but the blessings he received are far greater. Amen. Just like what Paul says about the sufferings you and I endure. He said the sufferings that you endure right now are not worthy to be compared to the glory that you're going to reveal, that's going to be revealed in you afterwards. Right? So it, you see an overlap between what's happening with Job and what happens in our life. Uh, yes, Terry, was that what you were going to say? Or yeah. did, 
Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. So Terry was going to point that out as well. So build out is, is also correct in saying that this, that, um, that this brief interval is going to be eclipsed by the glory that God brings into Job's life. If he'll just in repentance and reverence turn towards God. Now, the key thing to remember at this point is the major misunderstanding of everything so far. Job and his three friends, they all believe, like I said, that this is God's judgment against Job. Job believes God has made a mistake or that God is punishing him even though he is just. How do I know that? Well, because he says so. Job's friends believe this has to be for something Job did wrong initially. Both are incorrect. What makes this difficult is the dividing line. When all this started, I know I'm kind of repeating myself, but I just want to make sure you get it. When all of this started, Job had done nothing wrong, nor had he thought or said anything wrong. This was an attack from the enemy to destabilize Job from his integrity and get him to curse God. All the negative we hear coming out of Job in his response to this attack is not what caused the attack, but are instead just his responses to it. So it would be a huge error to interpret, uh, or I should say it this way, it would be a huge error in interpretation to fail to see this line of demarcation. God will adjust, address Job's attitude, irreverence, and self-justification later in the book, later in Job's trials, when he steps in and ends the trial by confronting Job. None of these trials, however, are due to Job's actions or words subsequent to the trial. That's very important to hold on to. As we continue, Bildad here attributes Job's trials to his temporal securities and devotions. This is both correct and incorrect, as is typical. So in Job uh, chapter 8, verse 8 through, I don't know where we're going to read to, I think verse uh, 19, says, for, this is still Bildad talking to Job, he says, for inquire now of former generations. In other words, he's saying, you know, even if you and I being, you know, uh, we only have one lifetime to live, and so therefore we're not going to catch everything, but that's why we have history and we learn from history. So let's look back on everybody who's gone before us and see what does that lead us to include, conclude about these events? Well, that's not bad advice. That's not, it's not the best advice, but it's not bad advice because up to this point, they don't have a Bible to reference. Amen? Yes, ma'am. Is that the sins of the Father? No, 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 no. Yeah. What, he's, what he's saying here, in other words, is in order to make sense of what's going on, let's look at how God has worked with man from as far back as we know. Okay. Let's learn from the experiences of our forefathers and see and try to apply what we can learn from that to what's happening to you and see if we can come up with a solution. Really, not bad advice. Not bad advice. Now, today, that would not be the best advice because it would be to try to learn from experience of others rather than from what the Word of God says. Now we have a line in the sand that tells us what right and wrong is. Job did not have that. Therefore, this advice was not misguided. Okay, So he says, For inquire now of the former generation, and pay attention to the findings of, our, of their ancestors. For we were born yesterday, and do not have knowledge, since our days on earth are but a shadow. Will they not instruct you and speak to you and bring forth words from their understanding? Can the papyrus plant grow tall where there is no marsh? Can reeds flourish without water? While they are still, uh, while they are still beginning to flower and not ripe for cutting, they can wither away faster than any grass. Such is the destiny of all who forget God and hope the hope of the godless perishes, whose trust is in something futile, whose security is in a spider's web. So this is kind of like an accusation against Job saying, you put your trust in things rather than God. Okay. He leans against his house, but it does not hold up. He takes hold of it, but it does not stand. He is a well-watered plant in the sun. It shoots spread out over its, uh, over its garden. It wraps its roots around a heap of stones and it looks for a place among stones. If he, is, uh, if he is uprooted from his place, then that place will disown him, saying, I've never seen you. 
Indeed, this is the joy of his ways, and out of the earth others spring up. Now, so what he's saying here is, he's talking about the temporal, the temporalness of man, number one. But as we have, and we'll continue to, to remind ourselves, this is a trial allowed by God, but it came from Satan. The clear and stated intentions of it were to create disloyalty where none existed beforehand. The devil's accusation was that Job's loyalty was only skin deep, and that such could easily be proven true if Satan were free to attack his possessions and his health. However, Job's statement that all he had feared had come upon him does seem to indicate that Satan had some basis for believing that Job's allegiance was to his temporal blessings rather than God. Also, Bildad here seems to believe something similar. Because he said, such is the destiny of all who forget God. The hope of the godless perishes, whose trust is in something futile, and whose security is a spider's web. Now, these are just accusations from Satan and assumptions from his friend Bildad, but they're not hard, so they're not really hard evidence. But, in fact, that Job feared the loss of these things implied that he did not trust them. However, he did. He does imply that he loved them. And that might have been what Satan saw and wondered if Job's love and comf of com for comfort and possessions outstripped his love and devotion for God. Okay? The very fact that Job was afraid these possessions could leave, he could lose them, tells me that his trust wasn't in them. If his trust was in them, he would have felt secure in them. Does that make sense to you? No. Wealthy people yeah. often believe, I'm so wealthy, I couldn't lose so much that I still wouldn't have plenty. Okay? And they trust in their possessions. Clearly, Job does not trust in his possessions because he was afraid he could lose them all. So, so Bildad was making the assumption the Job was placing his trust in his possessions. I believe Bildad was wrong. I don't think Job, Job did trust his possessions. That's why he was afraid of losing them. Are you following now? Does that make sense to you? People that are multi-billionaires typically are not afraid that tomorrow I'm going to be homeless. They're not afraid of losing their possessions. Most billionaires have lost a lot of money many, many times, and then they rise right up to the top again. They know what it is to lose money and gain it back again. They, they, they have confidence in their stuff and in their ability. And we see that all the way through. We not only see it in natural history, what's going on around us in the earth right now, the Bible is loaded with examples of it. The, the proud are lifted up thinking, calamity will never come near me. My money can make it all just go away. That's the, the thought patterns of most people that they're proud and they put their trust in their riches. Job was not that guy. He didn't trust in his riches. He's afraid that they could leave tomorrow and he'd never get them back. You can see a marked difference between the two. So I don't believe that Job was putting his trust in riches. But, so I think Bildad was wrong. However, he deeply cared about his comforts and his possessions because he lived in constant fear he was going to lose them. And I think that right there was something Satan said, uh-huh, he really likes all these comforts. I bet you that if I were to take them away from him, he would curse God. I bet you that's the source of his loyalty for God. You see what I'm saying? So I think that that's what was going on here. Now, and we need to, and we need to take a lesson from this. The devil knows you academically. Every human who comes into this world is studied and examined in order to identify weaknesses, angles of attack, if you will. The devil is not bad at his elected occupation. He is good at assessing our weaknesses and tailoring his attacks by which he can exploit you. If he knows that you're not really into money that much, it doesn't matter to you, he's not going to attack you regarding money. He's going to come at you from another angle. Why would he waste time for something that's really not going to give us much payoff? Right? Yes, ma'am. Satan, uh, he, he judges us and observes us and watches us by what we say and what we do. Mm -hmm. He does not know what we think. I don't know if he does or not. I can't tell you. Because I, I had 
heard that a long time ago that he didn't. So there, sometimes I catch myself in saying things I, out loud. Yeah, yeah, saying even in prayer to God when I'm yeah. speaking out loud, I. I don't know. I can't tell you. I mean, if there's a scripture that tells us for decidedly one way or the other, I don't know what it is. Uh, maybe spiritually, uh, thoughts are able to, you know, be something that there's a visual component to it, and therefore he would know what we're thinking. I don't know. I mean, uh, to some degree or another, because our bodies are hardwired to our immortal soul, there are things that trigger in our physical brain our physical organ from our soul, our mortal mind, our mortal soul. And so it's possible that he can just pay attention to that and get a basic idea of what we're thinking by knowing what's going on inside of our body. I mean, that's how they're making all these kind of electronic devices now that can speak for a person who doesn't have the ability to speak. They just think it and the computer can say what they're thinking. Well, how can they do that? Well, because they can, they can see what parts of the brain are triggered when you think certain thoughts. And so it's able to read those and translate it into a general statement that's pretty close to what you were thinking. And so if if a, if a computer can do that, chances are a demonic spirit could do that. But this is all Mark just rambling, I don't know. Okay, so I can't, and I don't have an answer for you. I don't know. But is it at least possible? Maybe. That's all, that's the best I got. <laughs> <laughs> That's the best I got. So uh, now, so it seems only reasonable that since we, since what we, uh, what happened to Job, were things he freely admitted he had always feared would happen or could happen, that the attack that of the enemy was designed to target these by design. So in one way, Bildad is almost certainly correct. Job's temporal desires did, in fact, pave the way to these specific attacks. However, it cannot be said that Job loved these things, these temporal blessings, more than the God who gave them. I do not believe that's true about Job, which was really the thing that Satan was attempting to prove. He's trying to prove Job loves the stuff more than the one who gave it to him. Okay? All of this being true, Bildad is still incorrect in that he was attributing this whole attack to God's judgment against Job as a man who was not blameless before all these uh, these events began, or they never would have happened. Now, going on to Job 8, chapter, uh, verse, uh, verses 20 through 21. Surely God does not reject a blameless man, nor does he grasp the hand of an evildoer. Bildad's correct, isn't he? He doesn't do these things. Where is Bildad wrong? He is assuming that Job's not blameless, and therefore he's rejecting Job because he's blameless. You see what you, are you seeing it? Yes, I'll read it again. Surely God, God does not reject a blameless man, Job, and see that he's rejecting you. You must not be blameless. That's the conclusion that Bildad's coming to. Nor does he grasp the hand of an evildoer. He will not. He will yet fill your mouth with laughter and your lips with gladness. Those who hate you will be clothed with shame, and the tent of the wicked will be no more. In the end here, Bildad's words are about 50% encouraging and correct and about 50% wrong and misleading. <laughs> so far, it still seems to me that Job's friends, at least the two that we've heard from so far, truly do want to help Job navigate out of the, uh, this difficulty back into the life of blessing he once knew. Uh, the next two chapters now are Job's reply and ongoing complaint. And I don't know if we'll be able to get that far, but we're going to try to. Uh, without going too long. Uh, Job chapter 9, starting in verse 1, then Job answered, truly I know that this is so. Okay, so he's he's agreeing with at least some of what Bildad has just said, right? Yes. Truly I know that this is so, but how can a human be, uh, be just before God? So he's saying, I think that what Job is kind of getting at here is that I know that that's true in a perfect world, but we're not living in a perfect world. So if no one is truly 100% blameless before God, that makes all of us a potential target. I think that's what Job is getting at. Job agrees with Bildad's words, but in the end, he believes that even if he had done everything he knew to do, God would still find fault because no one can truly stand before God in their own rightness. And, and there's a way in which that's true. A person can't stand before God in their own rightness. But there's a difference between rightness and blamelessness. Okay, we're not talking about righteousness. Righteousness would be to have perfect character that is just like God's. 
Well, no one's going to do that on their own. But can a person be blameless before God? Yeah, that means they're walking in the light of what they do know. They're not actively, willfully participating in known sin. Can a person do that? Yeah, they can do that, right? And in fact, that's what Job was doing, which is why God called him blameless at the very beginning of the book, right? The thoughts and the counsels of these men are so near the truth that it's almost painful to watch um, with what near misses they're avoiding the real issue. Because, uh, they, like I said, they're all pointing to judgment. And that's what they all think it is. Uh, it leaves me wondering how often you and I dance around the truth in a similar manner. Uh, just inches away from the truth that we fail to see. Biases are powerful things. And they do more to blind the eye than to enlighten it. Truth is, if these words that we're reading right now were not written in the biblical book of Job, but were just said to most people, most of those who claim that Job's friends were only filled with loathsome advice, they would probably find themselves agreeing with, they, with what they said. The only reason they don't agree with it is because they know it's in the book of Job. And these guys are bad guys. They've come to that conclusion. But if I were to take it out of that context and reword it a little bit and say the same thing, most of the same people that say that Bildad and Eliphaz and so far all said bad counsel would hear those words and say, well, that's right. That makes perfect sense. I mean, haven't we already seen that? I mean, all of it except for maybe one phrase out of most of what these guys says is right. What they're saying for the most part is correct. How they're applying it is wrong. You know, we to see these things rightly, we need the whole story. And so far, such has not been revealed to Job and his friends. So the scriptures are, uh, are, provi- are proven true, which says, He who answers a matter before he hears it, it is folly and shame to him. See, they're not working with the whole deck, are they? They don't have the whole story. They're just kind of, they're like a detective, and they're coming to hypothetical conclusions based upon partial information. And, and that's usually a dangerous thing. They're not presenting their findings as though it's a hypothesis. They're coming at it as though, well, this is the fact. And you can't really do that because they, the, they don't have all the data, do they? Not that these men were fools per se, but their thoughts and their counsels were not they were just a smidge off. You know, they were just a little bit off base because they don't possess all the facts. Now, in Job chapter 9, starting verse 3, it says, If someone wishes, and this again is Job's words, if someone wishes to contend with God, he cannot, he cannot answer him one time in a thousand. He is wise in heart and mighty in strength. Who has resisted him and remained safe? He who removes mountains suddenly, who overturns them in his anger, he who shakes the earth out of its place so that its pillars tremble, he who commands the sun and and it does not shine and seals up the stars, he alone spreads out the heaven and treads on the waves of the sea. He makes the bear Orion and Pleiades and the constellations of the southern sky. He does great and unsearchable things and wonderful things without number. If he passes by me, I can't see him. If he goes by, I can't perceive him. If he snatches away, who could turn him back? Who dares to say to him, what are you doing? God does not restrain his anger. Under him, the helpers of Rahab are crushed. Now, this is just, this is just tragic. Again, Job's not completely wrong. But the poor guy isn't right either. Job was innocent. Sure enough. But his thoughts and his mouth have cured that little problem. He's no longer so much so innocent. Now, and I recognize it all too well in the mirror. I don't know about you. But the reference that Job is making here, I want you to pay attention to them. Because later on, and I think this is just so beautiful, because Job doesn't feel invisible to God. He feels like he's God's target. But he thinks that God's deaf. He can't hear what he's saying out of his mouth. Because he keeps on wanting to have an audience with God as though God doesn't know what he's thinking. And not only that, but all the things that Job is saying out of his mouth, God's going to prove that he was listening the whole time because at the end of the book, he brings up almost every one of these things Job's saying right here and turns it around to confront Job. So make little marks when you, if, if you're a person that marks in your Bible or make little notes if you're a note taker uh, about some of the things that Job brings up so that when we get to the end of the book, you see God confronting Job, he brings up these same things. At one point, God brings up the constellations. 
Were you there when I made the constellations? Who was able to lead out the bear with his cubs? Or who binds the belt of Orion? Were you there, Job? You see what I'm saying? He's bringing up these very same things that he's saying as though he doesn't think God can hear him. So what does God do? He makes it very clear, I heard the whole thing. <laughs> you know what I mean? At the very end of the book. So pay attention to that. That's one thing. Now the reference here to Rahab is not regarding the the Rahab, the former harlot turned daughter of God through faith. We're not talking about that Rahab. Instead, this is in reference to um, uh, to one of the following, according to the commentators of the New English Translation. I'm just going to read it to you from their comments. Rahab is identified in parallelism to the sea in Job 26, verse 12, or the Red Sea, as found in Psalm 74, 13, um, and so also comes to symbolize Egypt in Isaiah 30, verse 7. In the Bible, the reference is only to the raging sea, which the Lord controlled at creation. So right here, when he talks about God does not restrain his, uh, his anger, under him the helpers of Rahab lie crushed, he's talking about the raging of the sea. Okay, something you and I would, it'd be totally lost on us, but in that day it would have been something, a reference that would be understood. Now, in Job 9, verse 14, it says, How much less, then, can I answer God and choose my words to argue with him? Although I am innocent, I couldn't answer him. I could only plead with my judge for mercy. If I summoned him and he answered me, I would not believe that he would be listening to my voice. So what's the point of even asking him to, for an audience if you don't even believe he's going to listen to you? Verse 17, he who crushes me with a tempest, a tempest and multiplies my wounds without any reason. That's a pretty stout accusation against God. Wouldn't you say? Yes. Here we begin to, to see Job's discouragement affecting his hope and his trust in God. What we're seeing here these words coming out of Job's mouth, the devil at the same time period is beginning to get hopeful. He's thinking, see, I was right. Any minute now, he's going to curse God, which of course he doesn't do. The devil was wrong. God was right. But he is kind of wallowing, isn't he? And again, we can, we can understand that. I get it. I get it. I'm not picking on the guy. But he is wallowing and he's allowing misguided poorly informed words to come out of his mouth, very accusatory towards God. So we begin to see Job's discouragement affecting his hope and his trust in God. It's more than understandable to become discouraged under such a, a opposition. And it's only natural that the human mind would question, where is God in all of this? That's, that's a legitimate question. And you know, Job could ask that question without being accusatory. Now, right? You could go to God and say, you know what? I don't understand where you are, but it seems like you're the enemy. But I want to believe different. Could you please speak to that? See, God, God will answer those prayers. But Job's really not asking a question. He's making a statement. And that's a dangerous thing. He whom we had formally concluded was immediately near and only associated with our blessings now seems not only to be complicit with our suffering, but is appearing within the limits of our reason to be the actual source of our suffering. I mean, God is, in Job's mind has made a flip-flop. The guy who used to be my blesser is now the guy creating all my suffering. You know, we have to keep in mind, Job did not have the, the book bearing his name to read, you know. He, nor did he have any other book of the Bible, for that matter, right, from which he could extract wisdom. He had only the testimonies of those who'd gone before him, as Bilidad had pointed out for consideration, that and the limits of his own experience. The more I think about this, Job's situation seems a lot more to me like Adam and Eve's in the garden. All they had known up to this, the encounter with the serpent in the, the, the garden was God's goodness, thoughtfulness, provision, and good intentions. That's all Adam and Eve had. They had no idea how to process thoughts of God being anything other than what he'd always appeared to be. It had never occurred to Adam and Eve that God had bad intentions in all that he had done. It had to be suggested to them. And now that it was in their brain, it was like a burr in their brain they couldn't get rid of. I don't know what to do with this. If, in fact, he isn't trustworthy, how could I trust his answer if I went and asked him a question? I don't know what to do with this. 
It wasn't an impossible situation. They should have gone to God, gone to God in trust and asked him in the cool of the day. That very day, they were going to have a walk with them, weren't they? Had they not screwed up. Yeah, they were going to have a walk. That would have been a great time to bring this up. Hey, you know what? This serpent guy came up and, and, and called your integrity into question, and we don't know what to do with this. And I got to tell you, I kind of wonder. He made a good case. Why are you giving us all these other trees and say that this really good looking tree in the dead center of the garden is the one we can't touch? And it's, and, and, you know, it's associated with the knowledge of good and evil. Why is it you don't want us to know this stuff? Are you holding out on us? It seems like a good question. God would have dealt with that. But instead, they didn't ask God anything. Jesus just made a unilateral decision off of a basis of partial information. And we've all been paying the price for it ever since. Job is doing the same thing, isn't he? In like manner, Job is repeating their mistake. He is answering a matter before he's had time to hear from God. In fact, in the midst of this misery that he's going through, no doubt that it was the devil himself who was suggesting to Job that no such audience would be given to him in the first place. If he'd sought an audience with God, the devil was probably whispering in, the de in, in Job's mind, you know God's not going to talk to you, which is why we heard out of Job's mouth. I don't believe he'd listen to me even if I had odds with him. Where do you think he got that idea? Same place that Adam and Eve got their idea. Probably the devil was whispering in his ear. Or, or that if he had been given that same opportunity, he didn't believe it would do him any good. The devil really is that bratty troublemaker in grade school who in instigates a problem and then ducks aside to insinuate that someone else was to blame for the problem. You know what I mean? That's the devil. That's him in a nutshell. How many of us can testify that his tactics really haven't changed that much? Yes. He does the same thing today that he's done since in the garden. And, and, the, and the reason why is because human beings haven't changed. We are embarrassingly the same. That's the reason why God was able to say, you know what? No new temptation has taken you, but it's common to man. The devil hasn't had to come up with new scripts, new material. The same stuff that worked in the garden is still working 7,000 years later. We still are falling for the same garbage. He doesn't have to come up with a new script. It's all the same thing. So Job continues his disgruntled belief that God is attacking him, although he is completely innocent. Here in verse, starting picking back up in verse 18 in chapter 9, says, He does not allow me to recover my breath, for he fills me with bitterness. If it is a matter of strength, most certainly he is the strong one. And if it's a matter of justice, will he not say, who will summon me? Although I am innocent, my mouth would condemn me. Although I am blameless, it would declare me perverse. I am blameless. I do not know myself. I despise my life. It's all one thing. That is why I say he destroys the blameless and the guilty. In other words, God doesn't show any difference between whether you're bad or good. He, he punishes everyone. Okay, now here we have an interesting window into Job's understanding of God, and it reveals an awareness of God, which is a bit puzzling. You and I, living as we do in the privileged world of possessing both the Old and the New Testaments, have a rich history to look back upon regarding God's interactions with man from the beginning, don't we? I mean, just rich. Under the New Covenant, being children of God and having his amazing precious Holy Spirit, both within and for some of us upon us, we live aware of God, don't we? We live aware of him. I honestly have a difficult time imagining a child of God uh, talking like this today. Job is essentially doing what the Israelites did at the mountain. They said to Moses, don't let God speak to us again, for who has ever heard the voice of God and lived to tell about it? In Ezekiel, I'm sorry, in Exodus chapter 20, verses 18 through 25, to which Moses could have easily turned around and said, Ah, you, you just heard God's voice and you're still alive. There's your answer to who has ever heard the voice of God and lived. You have. So why are you afraid? It was an illogical fear, wasn't it? And now, in like manner, Job is saying that if he could gain an audience with God, he doesn't believe that, um, that he could defend himself. He believes his own mouth would betray him and wind up condemning himself. Yet God was right there with Job as he was saying this. 
God just heard Job declare himself innocent and blameless. He said, if I could appear before God, I would want to declare myself innocent and blameless, but I don't believe I could even get it out of my mouth. I believe God would force me to say I was to blame. I couldn't even defend myself before God. And yet here he is already. God's already heard him say I'm blameless because God's very present right there. Clearly, Job did not see God as omnipresent in the same way you and I do. Otherwise, he would have already known God's already heard me say this. Now, this helps to illustrate how powerfully the Word of God has impacted the entire world, even among those who have never even read any scripture at all. The increasing knowledge of God has educated even the devout sinner with better theology than this ancient world had. I've, I've even been around ungodly people of the world who have said things that they knew were contrary to God, and when they did so, I've literally seen pagans do this, and they look up toward the sky and they say, sorry. You ever seen an ungodly person say something they knew was wrong, and they look up towards heaven saying, sorry, because they knew God was listening? Job didn't even know this. Can you see how the word of God, when it has entered into this world through the law, has impacted humanity across the globe? Even non-believers, if they still believe in a God, they know God hears what I'm saying. They believe God knows what they're thinking. Job didn't even believe that. I, I told you a while back, I, I hope that I can rediscover this guy. I ran across him in social media and I was not wise enough to set him aside um, to bookmark it so I could find it again. But there's a secular historian out there who has a little, uh, uh, it's part of his, what he teaches as a professor in um, regarding world uh, world history. And he teaches how the Bible, particularly the Old Testament, but both Testaments, have had a more profound impact on global morality than anything in existence. That, that, that if you go back in history and look at the morality of the common man before the law came, it was pure anarchy. It was a common thing to feel fully justified to murder someone over anything. To rape someone with Compute, a complete impunity, feeling no compunction whatsoever. To, to, to do things that even people who are ungodly today recognize, that's just wrong. Where did they get it was wrong? Because all of humanity before, before the law that didn't love God, they had no idea, no notion that was wrong. But when the law came into the world, it changed the whole planet. Ever since then, you, I mean, he, was, he has a, a, just a whole development of, of part of a series that he teaches in college about how ever since the law came through Moses, and this is not a Christian. He doesn't, he's not a Jew. He doesn't believe in the Old Testament as coming from God. He just believes that Moses wrote down some really good laws and that the Jews, when they followed it, just, it just changed the course of human history. Because And he can mark down, point out societies and how these societies, they used to do this and they used to be this way and they used to be that way. But when the law came, it's like within a short period of time, humans just changed. And all of a sudden, murder was generally understood as something that you shouldn't do. Or you ought to have a really good reason for it. You see what I'm saying? That didn't exist beforehand. And, and all of a sudden, uh, lands began to make laws consistent with that kind of morality. And it didn't exist before the law came. Right? So it's had an impact, hasn't it? Amen? Job was clearly living before that. And so he's scratching his head and he doesn't know about these things. He, and now he's, he knows that God can see. And God clearly has got his, uh, he believes that God's certainly got his red X on him. But he doesn't believe he could get an audience with God or that God hears his thoughts or his words. So there's a big difference here, wouldn't you say? Yes, uh-huh. How did Job even know there was God? Well, he's, a, he's in the early post-flood world. Everybody knew there was a God. <laughs> I mean, the world was still, you need to understand, 
the earth was still recovering from the post flood uh, from the from the flood for generations after the flood uh, well over a couple hundred years after the flood it took for the earth to begin to reach some point of equilibrium no Knew, oh, of course they knew. Yeah. And his children knew. And their children's children knew. And then if anybody had began to forgot and forget, by the time the power Tower of Babel came around, they were got all over refresher course, didn't they? So, I mean, they were they were aware of God, which is, remember, when we went through um, uh, the Old Testament, during the time period when Abram was called out of Ur the Chaldees and was walking through the land of Canaan before he had um, Isaac. Remember, he would run into various kings, and those kings, when when Abram talked about the God of heaven, that those kings knew who he was talking about. They served pagan deities that they were, were carved out of wood and stone and gold and other precious metals and stones, but when Moses talked about the God of heaven and earth, they knew who he was talking about. Do you remember that when we were going back through there? And he would run up against a king, and when he would tell them who he was following, they were like, they would say, Well, we know that God is with you. Not they, they didn't say, We know your God is with you. They said, We know God is with you. <laughs> so they clearly knew who he was, even then. So God was known. Oh, yes. Without question. Okay. Without question. Now, were belief systems beginning to develop about God that was inconsistent with God? Well, of course they were, because there was no written records. This was, uh, or if there were, you know, I don't know what they were. They would be long, you know, destroyed before now. But um, nonetheless, there was a general awareness of God. The one thing they knew for a fact is that ongoing sin gets a reaction out of him because we've had a flood and then we also had the time at the Tower, Tower of Babel where we weren't doing what he wanted and he confounded every lang everybody's language and now we're spread out all over the earth. So we know he pays attention and when he doesn't like what's happening, he judges. They knew that much, right? Now, there might have been a lot of stuff they didn't know, but that much they knew. The obvious, one of the things we know that Job, at least even as a god, the most godly man of the planet, did not know, he clearly didn't understand that he could have a one-on-one -on -one with God. Right? I think that's pretty clear by the things we've read so far. Now, by the end of the book, he knew it. And I, that was a game changer right there. That was a game changer. That was as world rocking as when Jesus came into the world and, and and told the Jewish community, said, you know, when you pray, pray with intimacy. Don't talk about God as some transcendental Shylock well, off in, the, in the far corners of the universe, but pray, my Father who art in heaven. It just changed the world for Jesus to talk like that. It was unprecedented. Well, here was one of those times. Job went from God just being this nebulous God to being someone I can have an encounter with. Do you think that might have changed, you know, at least those people who come to know Job afterwards, their understanding of God? I think so, right? So, yeah, you had something, Terry. Go ahead. Well, I was just thinking the context in my mind of how we think about, you know, World War One and World War Two. Granted, we have lots of media, we have lots of books, we yes. have lots of different things that carry it on. But for the people that are still around, that we still talk about it, and then many who would say, "Well, I know that my grandfather was in World War One, and he told stories about this." You mm -hmm. know that concept of what happened then. You know, yes. Like, you know that that would have been the case with Noah and, and his sons and his grandson and his great grandson. Exactly. They would have heard the stories and heard the stories and heard the stories. And like you said, it was backed up by the Tower of Babel. Oh, yeah. You know, because the people who were hearing the stories about what happened with the flood were now experiencing this definitely divine encounter yeah. that would have added to the prior story and continued on. You know? Exactly. So, like you said, depending on how far along it was after that, mm -hmm. there definitely would have been that concept of, of this divine being. An awareness, was, yeah. Without question. And that's and also you need to understand that on every continent on this planet and in almost every developed society around the world, there's a story of a worldwide flood and with a man who had built a big boat and had 
several family that went with him. And in fact, most of the cultures even have a derivation of the word Noah as the guy who God was talking with. This is on every continent on the planet. Today. Yeah, today. <laughs> but I mean, it dates back to so far that if if evolutionary development of mankind were correct, there's no way people over on this side of the world would have known that this side of the world had that tradition, that mythology. They had have taken this with them when they traveled there, right? This means it has far deep roots in history. And you and I wouldn't know when that was. It was the flood. <laughs> That's how far back it goes, right? Yes, uh-huh? Two more things. It adds to something that you've already touched on in prior times, but it's it just adds to the concept of having, especially those who were more away from people who were involved directly, would have been what their what that shows is a god of judgment who did Noah, who did exactly. Noah's Ark, who a god of judgment who did the Tower of Babel. So that whole judgment concept is in, is in their mind, which is what. Go ahead. Go yeah, ahead. and then the other thing um, is that. Although he's not saying it in the words a, a woman would or other people might use the words, I almost hear in the conversation you're talking about where Job is about him not thinking God's hearing him, I almost hear, well, I know he doesn't care about me because he's not, he, well, he won't hear me because he doesn't care, he obviously doesn't care about me. Mm -hmm. Or yeah. this wouldn't be happening. Yeah, yeah. So that, that concept of don't you care for me, yeah. I hear kind of behind the... It is. And that's, that is something that is behind all of human thought. Uh, and, and it's one that, that Jesus directly addressed with the disciples, if you remember. Remember when they were out on the water and these, these seasoned fishermen, I mean, they knew this water. They had been on it many, many times. They'd lived their life on this water. And the, the, these were not men who were easily spooked. And the storm that rose up that night when Jesus was asleep in the bow of the boat was such that they were absolutely convinced they were going to die. They knew it. And the only thing that came out of their mouth to Jesus was not, can't you do something, but don't you care? Don't you care? They didn't want to die without knowing that he cared about them. You know, when you're in the pinch, what's really in the heart comes out the mouth, you know? And so, yeah, that's something that goes like a subtext. It's going underneath and it's running behind the scenes of all of our thoughts and all of our actions, all of our life. It's an outcry from the heart. God, do you see me? God, do you care about me? Which is why I've, 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 I've made a lot of the phrase that we're not invisible to God. All the way through the Old Testament, when you see just somebody, a nobody. And it was clear that person wasn't invisible to God. Amen. And this over here, this nobody, the nobody knows this person's name. If God had not brought up that person's name right here in this passage, they would have evaporated from history. No one would have ever known them. They, they weren't prominent. They weren't a Moses. They weren't a Sarah. They weren't a, uh, you know, they were a nobody. And yet they had a problem. They cried out to God and God knew that person. Not invisible. Ongoing testimony of God. Amen. But Job didn't have that. Which is why what you said a moment ago, Terry, that's how I started, if you remember the book of Job, saying that all that Job knew of God was a God of judgment. He knew that if you're taken off bad enough, something bad's going to happen. That he knew. And he had that from the flood and from the Tower of Babel. That much he knew. Now, he also believed that God was the one that blessed his possessions. And they had come to a general idea that, you know, because I'm doing everything I know to do and I'm living right before God as best I understand and I'm living with the common man with equity and and with uh, with uh, with kindness and mercy and so on, therefore I can expect to get good from God. God gives good stuff to good people, bad stuff to bad people. Bad, which graduated into a general thought that bad stuff only happens to bad people. Well, now we got bad theology. So you can see where their arguments are coming from. It's coming from conclusions that they've come to honestly, but they really don't have the full understanding yet, do they? Right? Okay. So that's very, very important. Now, 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 now 
So, I mean, I, but as I was saying earlier, I've been around people, even in the world, who, who have said things ungodly and they look up to God, they're like, sorry, you know, and, and you know that they really don't mean it. But the very fact that they even think to say it indicates that they're aware he probably heard. He probably knows what's going on. You know what I mean? Something that Job obviously didn't even really have an awareness of. It evidently never occurs to Job to just start speaking to God, believing that God would hear him and even, in some way or another, respond. He's complaining, I wish I could get an audience with God. It clearly never occurred to him that he doesn't, to just say, hey, God. Now, you and I, we, we, we look at that like, how could that not occur to someone? Well, you know what? It probably wouldn't have occurred to me either if I was before the law. If I had nothing to go on, nothing to base this on. You know what I mean? So, you know, it's easy to judge Job because we're not him. <laughs> you know, we're not living the life this man lived or living in the time period he lived in. That's another clear indicator that he was before the law. Because after the law, there's obvious indicators that God hears prayer, isn't there? Over and over and over, there's proof. And yet for here, it just, he says, I wish I could get an audience, and it never seems to occur to him to just create one. Just cry out to him, right? As depraved as unaware, and as unaware as many people are in this world today, I think it would be a rare find indeed to come across someone who didn't think that if they spoke to God, he would not uh, that he would not hear them. I don't think that they, I don't think it, you're going to run across too many people that think that way. Uh, and that that's no, that's of course talking about people who believe there's a God. There's people that have talked themselves into believe there isn't one, but that's a different issue. That's a whole other different level of stupidity. But um, now. They probably don't believe that God's going to respond, but if they believe that they're a God, they do believe that he at least hears them if they said something, if they prayed. Now, tell me that that's not a huge, you know, influence from Scripture, even though, over those who've never read the Bible. I mean, I think that's just a huge impact that the Word of God has had over the world. Now, back in Job 9, starting to pick back up in verse 23, it says, If a scourge brings sudden death, he mocks at the despair of the innocent. That's just a terrible thing to say about God. That's a terrible thing to say about God. He mocks at the despair of the innocent. If a land has been given into the hand of a wicked man, he covers the face of its judges. If it is not he, then who could it possibly be? Now we've crossed a line. <laughs> Would you agree? Up to now, Job has simply thought God was judging him as if through some misunderstanding or because Job's um, perfections don't meet up with God's perfections. Now Job's all clear on the other side and claiming that God covers the sins of the wicked and takes some perverse pleasure in tormenting the innocent. Let's read the words again. If a scourge brings sudden death, he mocks at the despair of the innocent. He believes that's how he treats the innocent. However, if a land has been given into the hand of a wicked man, God covers the faces of its judges. So that it's not, it's not undone. So the wicked can keep the land. And if it's not God who's doing these things, then who could it possibly be? Oh yeah, of course we do. Of course we do. I mean, remember Asaph struggled with the same thing when he saw the prosperity of the wicked, right? And he began to think, you know, I, I day and night I've troubled my soul to do what is right for no reason because God clearly blesses the wicked. But then when he, but thank God, the rest of the psalm <laughs> is all about how he realized when he went to the temple of the Lord that he that his conscience caught up with and he realized the end of those people. What's the, what's the end of the story for the proud and the arrogant who makes it, who it looks like they're getting away with their wickedness? What's the end of the, their story? Well, destruction is the end of their story. He said, therefore, I repented and I, I, I realized that my words were like a brute beast before God. And I wished I had not said those words, right? Well, so I mean, so Job's not alone in this. Even people after the law said this, but at least the guys after the law had something to fall back on to realize their words were wrong. Job didn't have this. But so he's crossed a line here. 
Um, now Job is claiming that God covers the sins of the wicked and takes some perverse pleasure in tormenting the innocent. Verse 25, my days are swifter than a runner. They, spe they speed by without seeing happiness. They glide by like reed boats, like an eagle that swoops down on its prey. If I say I will forget my complaint, I will change my expression and be cheerful. I dread all my suffering, for I know that you do not hold me blameless. If I am guilty, why then weary myself in vain? If I wash my hand with snow water and make my hands clean with lye, then you would plunge me into a slimy pit and my, uh, and my own clothes would abhor me. For he is not a human being like I am, that I might answer him, that we might have come together in judgment. Nor is there an arbiter between us who might lay his hand on both of us, who would take hold, uh, I'm sorry, who would take his rod away from me so that his terror would not make me afraid. Then I would speak and not be afraid of him, but it is not so with me. Now, before addressing Job's terrible words against God, I want to capitalize on these last words of his. Job says, he is not a human being like I am, that I might answer him that we might come together in judgment. Again, this shows how little he knows and understands about God. God is the key, uh, God is um, the God who invites his followers to come and reason together, isn't he? That's right. Isaiah chapter 1 verse 18 says, Come, let us reconsider your, your options, says the Lord. For though your sins have stained you like the color red, you can become white like snow. Though they are as easy to see, meaning your sins are as easy to see as the color scarlet, you become, can become as white as wool. Now granted, Isaiah, in that passage, um, is a Jewish man prophesying to Israel who is in covenant with God. So they all have a leg up on Job there. But they have been continuously unfaithful to that covenant for some time when God says this. Even though these people, even though Israel was so perverted and so unfaithful to their covenant and so diabolical in their actions against God, God still extends the olive leaf and says, hey, let's talk about this. I read to you verse 18. I'm backing up now reading the first four verses so we get an idea of what was it that was going on with Israel before God said, hey, let's come talk, okay? So in Isaiah chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, it says, Here is the message about Judah and Jerusalem that was revealed to Isaiah, son of Amos, during the time when Uzziah, uh, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah reigned over Judah. Listen, O heavens, pay attention, O earth, for the Lord speaks. I raised children, I brought them up, but they have rebelled against me. An ox recognizes its owner. A donkey recognizes where its owner puts its food. But Israel does not recognize me. My people do not have understanding. Beware, sinful nation, the people weighed down by evil deeds. They are offspring who do wrong, children who do wicked things. They have abandoned the Lord and re have rejected the Holy One of Israel. They are alienated from him. That's the kind of Israel... God said, come, let's reason together, right? So in fact, these words would have been a healing salve for Job in his trials had they been available to him. And it sounds similar to the counsel of his friends because, uh, because they were telling him, hey, you know, you should just go to God. <laughs> It's what his friends were telling him. You know, Isaiah chapter, uh, if you would go beyond, just one, two verses beyond where God said, come, let us reason together. He also he says this. He says, if you have a willing attitude and obey, then you will again eat the good crops from the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you will be devoured by the sword. Know for certain that the Lord has spoken this. Now, like I said, granted, we have affirmed time and again that it was not Job's sins that brought all this on him. But as I pointed out last week, if in the middle of all of these trials, Job had just continued with the same attitude of worship he showed after the first attack, when he said, naked I came into the world, naked shall I return, 
Um, the Lord has given, the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. If he'd maintained that mentality throughout the second series of trials, I imagine God would have cut short the trials way beyond this point. It probably would have been over before it got to the point of this conversation between Bildad, Zophar, and Eliphaz. More than likely. I can't say that for certain, but more than likely. I think that's probably true. Job also said, Nor is there an arbiter between us uh, between us, who may lay his hand on both of us. That right there, that picture of laying one hand on the chest of God and one hand on the chest of man is the word propitiation, who Jesus is. That's what that word is. Someone who laid his hand on God and has laid his hand on man, bridging the gap between them. That's what Jesus has done for us. He's become the propitiation for us. He says there isn't anybody to do that for us, yet God is listening to everything that Job is saying, and he will in time inspire a young man to fulfill just this role in Job's life. His name is Elihu, someone who stands in the gap and provides a covering for Job, leading to an encounter with God that Job had so desired. But I am getting way ahead of myself, but I wanted to read it. It's way ahead. It's in Job chapter 33. It says, Man is chastened, uh, ch chastened with pain on his bed and with strong pain in many of his bones, so that his life abhors bread and his soul succulent food. His flesh wastes away from sight and his bones stick out where once they could not be seen. Yes, his soul draws near the pit and his life to the execu executioners. If there is a messenger for him, a mediator, one among a thousand, to show man God's uprightness, then God is gracious to him and says, Go deliver that one from going down into the pit. I have found a ransom for him. Whew. Aren't you glad that's what God's looking for? He said, His flesh shall again be young like a child's, and he shall return to the days of his youth. He shall pray to God, and he will delight in him. He will see his face with joy, for he restores to man his righteousness. So that's what's going to happen with Job. The very thing that he's asking, he's saying that there's no one here to lay his hand on God and me to bridge the gap between us. And God's like, I'm listening, and I'm going to send that boy to you before this is all over. You will have someone that will lay his hand on me and lay his hand on you and bridge the gap between you and I. Amen? Thank you, God, that God was listening, and he wasn't listening with a bitter heart. He was listening with a desire to set Job free. Amen? So now, wrapping up this, let's see. Um, Now, let's circle back and, and examine the words that were before this, uh, that Job said just before this, where he descends into yet another deep mischaracteriz mischaracterization of God. He now claims not only that God is judging him, even though he is innocent, he's now claiming that God is actively sullying his innocence. That even if he knew what to repent of, God would only take Job in his newly clean state and plunge him back into the slimy mire, against his will, back into correction. Job is at a loss to know how it could be any way other than this when he says, if it's not God doing all this, then who else could it be? Now, if Job had knowledge here, if he'd had knowledge here, this would very much have been like what the Pharisees did when they charged Jesus with casting out demons by the name of the Prince of Demons. This would be blasphemous if Job had knowledge, which he didn't have. Furthermore, Job is of such the character that if he had possessed that knowledge, he would sooner have died than to have accused God of such indecencies as these. I don't think these things would have ever come off Job's mouth if he had known. I, I don't believe that. And I think, that's, I think that that's proven by the way the story develops and by his complete repentance before God when God writes the record. You know what I mean? As soon as he's confronted with God and God explains it to him, the man was immediately complicit with God, immediately repentant towards God, and hated God his former thoughts and actions and words. So that's the reason why I think if Job had known these things, he would have never said anything like this out of his mouth against God.
grace. 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 Grace.